Good morning and greetings from Boston University School of Theology. Today we're pleased to share with you part three of Dr. John Hart's four-part webinar series on socio-ecological ethics. Dr. Hart's research interests and writing are focused on issues of social and ecological justice. Following that tradition, today's webinar is entitled Praxis, Contextual Dialogic Engagement of theory and practice. Our final webinar in this series will take place this afternoon from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We hope you'll join us. Dr. Hart. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> welcome once again. I'll add my welcome. Uh, we're here for part three, as was mentioned, in socio-ecological ethics. So praxis, contextual, dialogic engagement of theory and practice. And if you take the apart, you can figure out quite possibly what it means, but we'll have you do that. So the elements of this uh, socio-ecological praxis ethics and context are as follows. <clears throat> A compassionate community consciousness so we can be conscious in community of what's around us. Sometimes we are very conscious of our particular group, which perhaps is in, in, engaged in trying to bring about some kind of positive social change that would impact us, uh, especially after we've suffered for a long time from some injustice or injustices, and also go beyond that to try to uh, help out others who might be in similar kinds of circumstances. So compassion, we can be conscious of community, but not be compassionate. We can walk by people who are in need of assistance or even people that we know uh, from, again, a particular social group. So practice is the context of the dialogic relationship between theory and practice, consciousness and conduct. Full screen. Sorry about that in a moment here, I got it found. Here we go. Uh, sometimes people, I would say erroneously, just translate the word praxis to practice. So we have theory and praxis as if praxis is just translated to practice, doing something. Uh, actually, it means a dialogic engagement between theory and practice. So in praxis, that is in a particular social context where there might be some, again, an injustice or some issue that needs to be addressed, then the person brings to this particular context what they have learned already. It could be a religious tradition, it could be ethics, ethical principles, values, and so forth. And so what happens then in the context is that they bring this and then they're becoming aware of what's around them. So they would analyze the conditions that are there and then figure out what kind of uh, values and principles with which they are familiar might be used to address this particular problem, but not just what they bring to context, but what they learn from the other people who are involved in this particular issue and uh, <clears throat> this particular injustice that has to be resolved. So all of this is kind of coming together in context, what I bring, what each of you brings, and then the context itself in which we are coming together to talk about uh, particular issues. So ethics then is principles for right conduct in context. So people can again, bring to context the various ethical principles and values which they have, but they have to see if this is really what is best going to work to, again, eradicate an injustice, have a positive impact on the community in this place and in this time. So something that might work, principles that other people might accept in different contexts uh, might not be able to be accepted by the people in this particular place. And so we try to see what's, by analyzing the situation, <clears throat> what would be the most appropriate kinds of consciousness and conduct here. And the consciousness, again, is not just what I am conscious of, but what the community that is engaging with me in this place, in this time, uh, is conscious about. 
So it's uh, social justice in and among human communities. So that's part of the socio, socio-ecological, that uh, the socio has to do with society and social justice, and it's in, within a particular community, perhaps this particular, again, place and time, or a particular ethnic group, a group that's working for social justice. And <clears throat> it's uh, what kind of uh, principles might be best used in this particular uh, context. Social justice in, in and among human communities, so within the same community, and but then also beyond. How might this extend out to a broader community? And maybe we are a core group of people who have come up with ideas to try to make a situation uh, better than it was before, or better than it is now. And so we have this particular broadening out of ideas we have so other people can benefit, again, from outside this particular place and time. <clears throat> the ecological or socio-ecological, Ecological justice and well-being among all abiotic and biotic beings. The word abiotic means non-living, so whatever is without life is non-living, and then of course biotic is biotic beings, which means the community of all living beings, or the community of life, the biotic community. So how is justice able to be uh, established, renewed, uh, not only among people, but also with <coughs> our relationships to Earth, our planet, to other living beings? and among the living beings themselves, and those beings, the rest of the living community <clears throat> and Earth, so that we're all in a, aiming toward and trying to be in a harmonious relationship. It doesn't mean there are no more predator-prey relationships between, for example, uh, members of the animal kingdom, but it means that the evolutionary process that's going on will continue uh, to go forward uh, <clears throat> and, recognize, and recognize the inherent value, the intrinsic value of all of us who are participants in this place and time and beyond. <clears throat> so it's good to make a distinction between environment and ecology. Sometimes use the environment to generically mean uh, what really is ecology. Environment means a place, a place and what is happening in that place. Ecology is the relationships between those who are in this place. So think about it. Uh, uh, in the environment, there are ecological relationships. So in this place, there are relationships once again, among people, between people and other biota, and between all of us and our Earth home. <clears throat> so on the, you can see on the bottom there, Earth and all biota, Earth and humankind, humankind within humankind, and then all non-human biota and humankind. So there are all these kinds of ecological relationships that are, that are going on. So, going back then to see how this all comes together. So we are in this place, in this time, we are looking at socio-ecological praxis ethics. The socio having to do with society and justice in society. So we talk about social justice in communities, in a particular community, and then extending beyond to the broader community. Uh, so that's, that's the socio-ecological part, and well, the socio part, then the ecological part how, what are our relationships? So the way we often think about ecology or environment is that it's just about the earth and the place we live and so forth. But it's really a matter of looking at the relationships in which we are engaged. You can think in your own community, for example, what are the members with which you are engaged, consciously or unconsciously? They might be neighbors a few houses down, if you live in a residential community or a few apartments up or down and so forth. But maybe you've never passed them on the stairs, on the street, on the elevator. And if you become more conscious, as has been pointed out by a number of people's engagements, uh, trying to help people out, all of a sudden you realize that there are people maybe who are hungry, there are senior citizens who are cold in the wintertime because they can't afford to pay for heat, have to choose between, am I gonna eat dinner tonight, uh, as simple as it might be, or am I gonna be able to keep my uh, temperature regulated at a sufficient level in my, um, my thermostat at home, <clears throat> that I won't freeze tonight. So it's a very hard choice that people have to make sometimes. We're to spend it so much on food here and so much on the rent. All of these factors come in in a particular place. So we become conscious of those who are living around us in ways that we never happened before. It's, uh, it has a certain sense of awareness of place. Uh, the Buddhist, uh, Vietnamese Buddhist uh, teacher Thich Nhat Hanh <coughs> talks about mindfulness, that we should always be in a practice of mindfulness, and not, as we often 
speaking for myself, my tend to do is, okay, what, what comes next? What am I looking for, forward to doing next week? How do I develop a plan for this or that particular issue? But rather, in this place and this time, what do I know about the people who are around me? And if I'm in a, an area where there might be other kinds of living beings around, and what, um, what might be my relationship to them? What might be their needs? For example, a polluted body of water near where we are. It could be for a city, it could be a reservoir. If something happened in the reservoir is not producing clean water. So that impacts myself, my family, the community, far beyond where I am living and, and working and so forth. It could impact the wildlife in the forests around the reservoir. It could impact pets, livestock on farms that might be nearby and so forth. So how are all of these impacted in this particular community at this time? And to be conscious of the local needs and then extending beyond. Uh, maybe the pollution doesn't particularly affect my household, but once I become aware about it, aware of it, then I might recognize how it might affect uh, other households, other living beings, and so forth. So air goes around the earth very rapidly. We don't think about it, but uh, if you, those of you who uh, might recall um, either Three Mile Island, the nuclear explosion at Three Mile Island, or Mount St. Helens in Washington State when that uh, basically exploded, uh, when the volcano erupted and so forth, that the ash, well, the radiation, radioactive, the impacts of Three Mile Island were felt in the water locally, where, water, where the radiated water was put often without going through safeguards into bodies of water nearby. And then also the smoke from uh, Mount St. Helens went around the world. And there were ashes that were covering parts of Europe, for example. Uh, there were impacts uh, around the world. Uh, I read once, and you can substitute your favorite religious leader here, that every time we breathe, we're breathing a molecule of air that Jesus breathed. If you're a Muslim, you might think about it in terms of every time I breathe, I am breathing a molecule of air that Muhammad breathed, or, and, and so forth. Buddha, all these, and that's chosen because people are conscious of, often of religious figures, even if you're an atheist. Uh, you've probably heard these names. So every molecule, choose your favorite atheist in that case, uh, every time we breathe, that's how much the air keeps on circulating, not only in the present era, Mount St. Helens or Three Mile Island, but also from past years. It's always in a, in a state of, of uh, extending beyond its original place and time. So if, if we remain conscious of that, then we won't just think of, well, there's some smoke going up someplace else uh, several hundred miles away. That, that doesn't impact me, but it might very well. So if you're, in a sense, self-interested, uh, I am actually being poisoned by gases coming up over there or by what is put into the water over here and so forth. But to think beyond myself and not just do things out of self-interest, that is because it's good for me, but also beyond my own self-interest to look at a community interest. And once again, we're getting to the biotic community, the community of life as a whole, and then the abiotic uh, setting for life. Uh, pollution in Earth could also last through generations. People talk about the, the residues from nuclear power where the plutonium is buried and out of sight, out of mind. Uh, but that can last for 10,000 years, so future generations uh, will be impacted. Uh, on the uh, Columbia River, in the Columbia River watershed, <clears throat> what happened during World War II is a place called the Hanford Nuclear Reserve. To construct this uh, in world, during World War II, uh, the, the peoples who were living in that area in Washington State were forced to relocate. Uh, the, there was a bit of racism. The Indian peoples who were there, the Wanapum, the river people, were forced to leave on very short notice. And that's where they had sheds drying the salmon which they had caught and so forth. And they were forced to go to, to urban areas with which they were not familiar. And they weren't allowed to fish anymore. Uh, so what happened was eventually, <coughs> Nuclear power was generated uh, mostly just for just locally to help develop nuclear weapons. Uh, some of the devices that were used to drop the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were developed and manufactured at Hanford, uh, what's called the Hanford Nuclear Reserve. What happened as a consequence of all this manufacture is in the, in the industrial process, they had these giant 55 gallon drums. You might be familiar with these, they're used for a variety of purposes and they put into them chemical residues and radioactive chemical residues from the manufacture of these various kinds of 
uh, radiated products, and they buried them underground. Of course, thinking, well, pretty soon, uh, it's going to be going to be unearthed and put in a safer place. This is not a good place to have a barrel, uh, even though they're metal and they're expected to last for a while. Nothing, as you know, lasts forever. So, <clears throat> 50 years later, 60 years later, they were still underground, and people began to notice that there were strange colored fluids that were leaking out of the ground and going downhill into the Columbia River. It was also a place that was a major spawning ground for salmon. And both the river people, the one of them who depended on the salmon, and local fishers uh, of whatever ethnic group, as well as communities, all of a sudden they would find that the salmon was not safe. It could be very safe apparently on the outside, but one Indian fisher was telling me uh, when he picked it up to take in his boat and he pressed it with his hands, it, his fingers went right through the salmon and it had deteriorated entirely, or almost entirely, on the inside. So there are things even that seem to be okay, but that are not. So what was once nuclear waste that was used to help develop nuclear weapons to drop bombs, now is a, in a sense, an, uh, an ecological bomb, uh, something that is devastating uh, in the Columbia River and so forth. It's been estimated, the estimate keeps going up, it might be 50 billion with a B dollars to try to clean it up. It, then it came out to be 60 million and so forth. I'm not sure, or 60 billion, I'm not sure what the current estimate is. Uh, and there have been some gradual efforts to do the cleanup process. So sometimes these consequences are long term, just as breathing that molecule of air. You're breathing something that your favorite religious leader once uh, breathed at some point in the past, even thousands of years. And something that is buried in the earth. And it's become polluted, it's a fluid, then it goes down, and it's not only polluting that area of the earth, <clears throat> but also goes into the Columbia River, where salmon spawn, and has impacts on the salmon. Uh, there are no warning signs on that particular beach to stay away from where this, uh, this site, where you can see these strange colored uh, little waterfalls and, and creeks going down into the river. Uh, I've seen people out in boats when I was looking at the site, visiting the site, uh, families who had picnic baskets and they were, they were fishing in this place where the salmon were not healthy to eat. And they were also <clears throat> planning on coming ashore at some point uh, and having a picnic. Uh, so I asked the, the guide we had at Hanford uh, from the plant and I said, uh, isn't it kind of dangerous? He said, well, you know, he said that the water right here at Hanford is safe. Uh, the average glass of water, you can see how facts are developed. The average glass of water taken out of the Columbia River uh, doesn't have as much pollution or radiation as uh, elsewhere. Uh, <clears throat> and so I said to him, well, what's an average glass of water? He said, well, we measure 10 miles upstream. That is before the fluids enter the water. And then we measure 10 miles downstream. And so since it's 10 miles in each direction, we take the average, which we estimate is what it is here. But wait a second. There is no pollution 10 miles upstream. So you're, you're factoring in unpolluted water with highly polluted water and say, see, it's okay to drink uh, the water that's there. The same thing, people worry about radiation by way of passing near some of these sites. And uh, <clears throat> he said that, well, the average radiation, is that word average? And the average radiation is less than the city of Spokane, where some of the folks were from. And I just couldn't help myself. We were on a bus and I said, is there really such a thing as an average radiation? He said, well, no, there, there's not really average radiation. They just take the whole grounds of the Hanford Nuclear Reserve and, and uh, take a percentage of it, and so that's what the radiation is, as if it were the same everywhere, even when you have non-irradiated areas and irradiated areas. So be careful about the statistics, statistics, but it also shows how in the air, in the land, and in the water, there can be long-term pollution uh, impacts of things which we realized perhaps were not safe, but, well, it's okay, they're in barrels, they're in drums, they're supposed to be uh, leak-proof. Well, maybe for ordinary fluids like water uh, and some non-toxic materials, but here you have highly hazardous materials that have deteriorated and have broken through, rusted through the, uh, the barrels underground, and now these various colored uh, creeks are going down to the Columbia River. So when we talk about socio-ecological again, what are the societal impacts uh, in and among human communities? Think of the family fishing in a boat out in the Columbia. Think about the Indians who would catch the salmon and the non-Indian fishers who would also catch the salmon, either for personal family uses or to trade or to sell uh, and so forth. So 
there are those relationships among people, and then with the salmon itself, they're being uh, harmed by the radiation, the radioactive fluids that are going in the water and so forth. Think about if you've ever been fortunate to be at a place where eagles come during a particular time of the year, and they, if you've seen photos on TV uh, or videos, that the eagles come down, they pick up the salmon in their claws, and they take it off into a treetop, and then they eat there or provide a nest in their nest for their young and so forth. Uh, so eagles are impacted. Bears go fishing for salmon with their claws, of course. Uh, I haven't seen a bear with a fishing rod, but there they are, and so they're impacted. <clears throat> and you can see the trees and so forth, everything around the riverbank. Uh, so looking at the socio-ecological impacts of what we are doing, both now or from the past and into the future. And so in this context, once again, this praxis, how do we bring our knowledge, our values, the principles we have about taking care of God's earth, for example, caring for creation, and taking care of other members of our community, our human community, so caring for creation and community. So how is that best effected at this place and this time, given that what we bring to it in terms, again, of our principles and values and perhaps religious traditions, but also what is already present there, or what was once present in the past, the manufacture of, of uh, nuclear uh, weapons and, and the waste that resulted from it. Uh, so kind of keeping all that in mind, and the ethics then is developed from this context, it doesn't mean we come in there with a tabula rasa. I, I don't have any ethical principles or religious beliefs or anything else. No, it means you carry them with you, and then you maybe make a prioritize. There are some that are non-negotiable. I think these are very core principles that we should be living by. Um, and then some maybe are negotiable because we weren't quite sure. We recognize that they developed elsewhere, maybe hundreds of years in the past, originally in Europe. Uh, but over time, there are changes in, in psychology, human psychology, there are changes in context and awareness of these various issues. And so how do we then in this situation incorporate what people who are living there, taking part in the dynamics of this place, you know, what might they have learned over time, and how can we work together to try to retain what is essential, our core principles, but also see how uh, they might be adapted to context, uh, and that also we might adapt from context, that would be very helpful to help promote a just society and care for creation and community. So that's not quite in a nutshell, but that's socio-ecological praxis ethics. Thanks very much for being with us once again, and we're open to questions uh, and he might be coming in from, uh, from those of you out there in video land. Any questions? Seeing not, thank you all for being here. Join us again at 1 o'clock. Bye-bye.